Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 760 for March 24th, 2019. This time around, I'm in Cornwall, Ontario for the wonderful World of Whiskey show this weekend at the NAV Center. And coming up in a few minutes from Cornwall. So ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a silly question to ask some of you, but how many people have been to Isla? If you listen to John McShane at a master class, you'd think he's been part of the Scotch whiskey industry his whole life. Truth is, he made whiskey his second career a few years ago when he joined the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society as an ambassador. We sat down after one of his master classes this weekend in Cornwall, and you'll hear our conversation later on WhiskeyCast in depth. I'll have more highlights from the weekend too, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, the calendar of events, and on Behind the Label, we'll answer a listener's question about a unique type of wine cask used in finishing some whiskeys. It's all just ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. And for what seems like the umpteenth week in a row, let's update the Brexit situation. As of this weekend, there's a tentative agreement to delay Great Britain's exit from the European Union briefly. British Prime Minister Theresa May and her EU counterparts agreed to a short delay this week in Brussels. But it all depends on what the British Parliament votes on this week. If Parliament approves the exit plan that May agreed to last fall, the exit would be delayed until May 22nd. But that plan has already been shot down twice. If it happens again, the exit would take place on April 12th. Why those dates? Well, elections for the European Parliament are set for May 23rd, and May wants to avoid having to take part in those elections, if at all possible. The drop-dead date for the UK to say whether it will have to take part in the European election is April 12th. Also in politics, we reported last month on the impact of tariffs on American whiskies imposed by the EU, Canada, Mexico, China, and other trading partners in the middle of last summer. The Distilled Spirits Council estimated those tariffs caused an 8.2% decline in U.S. whiskey exports between July and the end of November from the previous year. At the time of that report, December's export data was not available. It is now. And the numbers show exports for the second half of the year were down by 11% from 2017. However, the first half of the year was strong enough to help set a new record. Overall exports for 2017 totaled $1.18 billion, up 5.1% from 2017. Now, around 60% of American whiskey exports go to EU member nations. The first half of 2017 showed a 33% increase in exports, largely as exporters stocked up in anticipation of the tariffs but they fell by 13.4% during the second half of the year. Here in Canada, imports of American whiskeys fell by 6.4% during the second half of 2017 after the tariffs took effect. That's compared with a 12.5% gain during the first half of the year. Overall, 2017 American whiskey exports to Canada gained 1.9%, with a value of around 50 million U.S. dollars. The biggest impact of the tariffs has been on small distillers, including Balconis Distilling in Texas. 
But the folks in Waco have something much worse on their minds this weekend. Wednesday night, distillery manager Zach Pilgrim suffered a stroke, and despite the heroic efforts of doctors to try to save him, he died Thursday at the age of 38. Zach was head distiller Jared Hempstead's right-hand man, managing all of the day-to-day operations at the distillery. Balconis is setting up a memorial fund to help Zach's family. We will have more details as they become available. And please join us in extending our condolences to Zach Pilgrim's family and the folks at Balconis Distilling. In other news, the Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau is giving whiskey lovers and the industry more time to submit comments on the agency's proposed changes to U.S. alcohol regulations. As we reported back in December when the proposal was released, the original deadline for comments was this weekend. But several of the major industry trade groups asked for more time. Given that this is the first major revision to those regulations since 1935, the TTB agreed. The new deadline is now June 26th. You can find more details on those proposed changes in the news section at whiskeycast.com. Work is moving forward in Ireland on Diageo's new Rowan Co. distillery at the Guinness St. James's Gate complex in Dublin. In the meantime, the first Rowan Co. whiskey is now making its debut in the U.S. after being released in Ireland and the rest of Europe a couple of years ago. Diageo master blender Caroline Martin started working on the recipe for Rowan Co. back in 2014, around the same time that the company was publicly getting out of the Irish whiskey business with the sale of Bushmills. It was very much a sweet lemon curd for myself. I have 33 years in the business, but most of that has focused on Scotch whiskey. So the fundamental um, capability and the, the, you know, the blending process is is the same, but the flavours are quite different. So my, I had to get my nose and palate round about the flavours that come through Irish whisky maturation. Uh, so it was, it was learning very much at the start in 2015-16, and then narrowing down what whiskies I, I wanted to use in, in this blend, and at the same time identifying a niche within the world of Irish whisky that was going to be quite unique and quite different from any of the other competitors that were out there at that point in time. So that was the basic fundamental process. A lot of work at the bench for me using cask samples of Irish whiskey to get the flavour balance right, to get the alcoholic strength right and to fill this niche that I had identified. What niche was that? In terms of a flavour map, it was very much about continuing with the smoothness, so that was critically important for me for the blend, whilst given a depth of flavour that I thought was quite different from anything else out there. So I didn't want it to be uh, heavily complex in flavour style. In fact, I think one of the key descriptors for Ronco is all about its elegance. Um, So it's very um, approachable and accessible in flavour style, and it works really well as a neat serve with straight mixers and in cocktail serves too. As for the distillery itself, final work is underway under the supervision of head distiller Laura Hemi, and production is expected to begin in May. The Visitor's Center will open in June, and it'll be separate from the Guinness Stillhouse Visitor's Center. By the way, you'll find my tasting notes for Rowan Co. at whiskeycast.com. Meanwhile, Diageo will be releasing next month what may well be the oldest official distillery bottling of Mortlock yet. The 47-year-old bottling is the first in a new Singing Stills series of single cask bottlings using the final three casks from 1971 left in Diageo's inventory. Only 94 bottles will be available worldwide with a recommended retail price of £10,000 each. But one bottle will be available to the public through a special lottery run by Justerini and Brooks in London. The winner will get the right to write a check for that 10,000 pounds. One final bottle will go on the auction block this coming week at Bonhams in Singapore with all of the proceeds going to charity. 
And while we're talking about Mortlock, Adelphi is releasing a new 25-year-old Mortlock single cask bottling. Only 314 bottles will be available, with a price in the UK of around 235 pounds each. The Glenlivet is releasing the third edition in the Winchester collection, honoring longtime master distiller Alan Winchester. The vintage 1967 edition is blended from Glenlivet casks, all at least 50 years old. Only 150 bottles will be available at a price of $25,000 each. Now, here in Canada, they're getting ready to say goodbye to Glenfiddich's Rich Oak single malt. This was a travel retail staple for Glenfiddich in past years, and Canada is the only market where it is still available. That's changing, though, according to Glenfiddich's Canadian brand ambassador, Beth Havers. We've had it here available since 2013, 2014, so we've had it for a number of years and it's built quite a following, so we asked them to continue to make it for, for us for the past couple of years. Uh, and I know uh, people will be stocking up on the final bottles. This will be the first time Glenfiddich's Bourbon Barrel Reserve has been sold outside the U.S. We do have one other Glenfiddich note. Several years ago, Glenfiddich and its Canadian importer, PMA, started a program to donate $2 from the sale of each bottle of Glenfiddich's 15-year-old Solera Reserve to Wounded Warriors Canada. They're getting close to $1 million in donations over the years an amazing cause, uh, helping people with PTSD, first responders and uh, veterans with PTSD. Uh, when we've been involved with them starting in 2012 actually, so uh, something that we're really proud of here in Canada. The program is only available in Canada though. Back in October, we reported on a new experimental series from Jack Daniels. The Tennessee Tasters Selection Series is made up of unique projects selected by members of the distillery's tasting panel. Now, the third release in the series is coming out. Reunion Barrel was picked by master distiller Jeff Arnett and is likely the first ever wine cask finished Jack Daniels. The distillery sent some of its used barrels to a Tennessee winery, which then sent them back after using them for one of its wines. Arnett then finished off some mature Jack Daniels in the barrels. It'll be available at the distillery and selected Tennessee retailers for around $40 a bottle. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. Join the Highland Park Inner Circle and get the latest news directly from Orkney, along with the chance to buy special releases and much more. Best of all, it's free. Find out more and check out the entire range at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Now, you see a lot of things at whiskey festivals, but I have never seen anyone wearing an entire outfit made out of purple Crown Royal bags before. What's your name? Wayne Pike from Cornwall. Tell me how this came about. I can't imagine that there wasn't some whiskey involved somewhere. Well, my wife likes to drink a lot, so she drank 55 bottles of Crown Royal to make this outfit. This weekend, I knew it was a little bit dressier, so I needed a 56 bag to make the bow tie. She really drank all of those. I'm just kidding. No, don't tell her that. Let's get her over here. Okay, Aaron. He says you drank all 55 bottles. <laughs> I definitely helped. I definitely helped, but not all, no. <laughs> How did he break this to you that he wanted to make an outfit out of Crown Royal bags? Oh, well, we've always been Crown Royal fans and always collected the bags, and Wayne is very eccentric and loves to dress up and so he came up with this idea and we went with it and who made the outfit aaron's mom made the outfit i had taken a sewing course and i had the concept she's a very good seamstress but she didn't understand kind of my ideas so the two of us together i put the bags together i told her what to sew and when to sew and she did great job and the two of us together three days 56 bags beautiful outfit very comfortable are you going to make a matching one for you? 
along the way, I'm sure we'll we'll work something like that out. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure he would want me to. So what? She has a uh, crown royal bikini. No, I'm kidding. I imagine you're not going to wear this to parents' night at school. <laughs> We don't send our kids to school with marbles in the Crown Royal bag like they used to do in the 70s. That would go over really well with the PTA, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you both, guys. Thank you. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. First off, while the Spirit of Toronto Festival is not until May 4th, tickets for the event and its master classes go on sale online this Monday, March 25th at 10 a.m. Toronto time. Distel's Andy Watts will be in London this week for bottle signings and tastings of his Baines Cape Mountain whiskey at several Amethyst Spirits stores. We have the details at the website. The Kensington Wine Market in Calgary, Alberta has its The Not Scotch Festival on the 28th. And Davin de Kergamo will lead a Canadian gold tasting at the Strathcona Hotel in Victoria, British Columbia that same night. Whiskey Fest Chicago is on Friday night, the 29th. Whiskey Live London is also this coming weekend, along with the Whiskey Festival Nord Nederland in Kroningen, the Netherlands. Val Blair's John McDonald will lead a tasting for the Whiskey Exchange at Smith & Walensky in London, April 2nd. And I'll be at the American Whiskey Convention in Philadelphia, April 5th. The Whiskey Festival Rhine Ruhr is on the 6th and 7th in Dusseldorf, Germany. And Jack Rose Dining Saloon in Washington, D.C. has its annual Premier Drams Tasting on the 7th. Right now, we have 219 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. Just use the search button to find events near you or wherever you may be traveling in the coming year. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Le Stow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeau edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Over in Japan a couple of years ago, at uh, to Tokyo, we were. There was Neil Aitken, who's the, uh, who's the, 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 the international director at uh, SMWS. And one of the evenings we had free, we said to go out and look for a few whiskey bars. And we found one or two, but eventually we just kind of gave up. On the way back from Tokyo on the plane, into my bag, we pulled out a copy of Whiskey Magazine that I hadn't read on the way over. And guess what the main feature was? <laughs> Tokyo and its whiskey bars <laughs> by Stefan Van Eiken. So we missed out on a few there. John McShane is the global brand ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and to listen to him, you'd think he'd been part of the whiskey industry his whole career. But like many people, he chose to make whiskey his second career. He's in Cornwall this weekend to present master classes at the Wonderful World of Whiskey show, and we sat down for a chat. How'd you get into whiskey in the first place? I got into whiskey a long time ago, Mark, when I used to go to my grandmother's house on Hogmanay, way back when I was a kid, all my father and all my uncles came along with their own bottle of whiskey, and they used to give each other a dram out of their bottle, and that's kind of how it all started. I had an uncle, uh, Uncle Jim, who always brought black bottle. The others all brought bells and teachers and white horse, and I asked him why, and he said he reckoned that because Black Bottle was less popular, they couldn't bottle it so quick. There was no need to bottle it so quickly, so it was actually older than the others. <laughs> and, that, and that was his reasoning for that, you know. But how'd you wind up in the industry? I mean, did your parents, did your father, or did your grandfathers, any of those folks work in the industry? No, no. I've uh, been a member for a long time, since, since the 80s. Um, but I used to work in financial services. I used to work with Zurich Insurance Company. And then with Lloyds of London. 
uh, insurance house. Uh, but back in 2007, the society were looking for members to become ambassadors to extend the members' tasting programme. So I put my hat in the ring, as it were, and after an interview and a tasting session, I got the job. So originally, I had still had the real job, <laughs> if I can call it that, but originally I was only doing member tastings around the area where I lived, in the south of England. Uh, but eventually, I gave up uh, working in financial services about 2012. So since then, the job has blossomed. I've done a lot more for the society in terms of events, tastings and media things and abroad as well, home and abroad. But you sound like you've worked in the industry your entire life, the way uh, you explain everything. I guess uh, I've always had that interest in it uh, and uh, yeah, I, I grew up with it. So I've always had that keen interest and I guess yeah, it comes natural to me maybe. <laughs> although although I, do, I do read blogs and books all the time to keep my uh, knowledge up. Tell me about uh, the changes we've seen in the society over the years, because obviously when you signed on board, it was still owned by Glen Morangy. It's now owned by a private consortium or a private equity firm, whatever you want to call it. But we've seen some changes over the last uh, really five to seven years. I think that when we were owned by Glen Morangy, we had access to their stock of casks. So a lot of the casks that we were able to bottle came from those sources. Uh, when we left Glenmorangie with our agreed 5,000 casks that we bought, uh, bought uh, as we left, we then had to work hard to rebuild relationships all around the industry. We had to recognise that the world was changing and people were appreciating other flavours as well from whiskies around the world, from other spirits. Our membership was changing, the demographic was changing, it was getting younger, it was getting more mixed between men and women. So we worked hard to try and uh, satisfy those members' demands. So the members want to see as much as possible from society in terms of a wide spectrum of flavour and we worked hard to give them that. So you will have seen in recent years casks being bottled from distilleries that we hadn't bottled for 10, 12, 15 years. You have seen new distilleries coming on stream, and there will be more to come in the next couple of years, that is for sure. And let's explain that those casks that you got from Glenmorangie weren't all Glenmorangie and Ardbeg casks, because at the time, Glenmorangie had discontinued its Bailey Nickel Jarvie blend and was acquiring casks for that blend, plus other, other whiskies that it had been working on at the time. So it had a bunch of other distilleries in that stockpile. Yeah, Glenmorangie had lots and lots of whiskey casks. In the stock, not just Glenmorangie and, and our bag. In fact, when Glenmorangie took us over in 2004, they studiously said they wouldn't give us a lot of Glenmorangie casks in case it made it look like we would become a, a, a part of the Glenmorangie operation. So we used to get lots of other casks from them, from casks that they had swapped or acquired for their blends, as you say. Uh, and that's, that's how that happened, yeah. You joke during your tastings about uh, rioting in the streets in Scotland when uh, the society first bottled a Japanese whiskey, and the society has moved on since then to bottle Indian, grain, along with rum, cognac, armagnac, and others. Now you're doing Irish whiskey, rioting in the streets this time? <laughs> no, at all. I think that uh, the, the mood of the membership has changed because what the membership want now has changed. It's not just about single casting and malt scotch anymore. That will always be by far the major part of what we do. But we have new members, old members, who are looking to widen their experiences and they want us to give them as many casts as possible, not just from Scotch whiskey, from other countries as well. They read in the press and in blogs about the awards that are being received by these uh, countries' whiskies. They read about the popularity of Japanese and Irish. So it's only right that we should actually let them experience single cask for themselves from us. And you've done a few bourbons too. We've done a few bourbons. We've done, a, we've done bourbon for a while actually. Uh, and uh, we would look to do more in the future for sure. That's, that's right, yeah. Take me inside one of these tasting panel sessions because uh, the society is known for these legendary tasting notes 
that uh, almost defy explanation at times. Take me inside one of those sessions. In a, in a session like that, we have a chairman and we have a group of people around uh, uh, the table sampling the whiskey. Now, what can easily happen is that if, if someone who's very quick to identify the flavours comes out very quickly with those descriptions, it can influence other people. So we all have to remain silent for a couple of minutes so everyone gets their idea of flavour and then they'll feed it back to the chairman. He'll bring that together and you remember we, we had bold statement, bold words on the tasting notes and that was where more than one person uh, said, said that particular flavour. Um, but see, as I said before, what we are about is about bringing fun to the membership as well as the flavours. So our tasting notes won't be dry descriptions of uh, honey and fruits and uh, meaty flavours. We'll try to draw pictures into the tasting note, which is why I mentioned the leather, the old leather in a, in a car earlier. So if someone has got a, an experience which brings to mind, we can get that on a tasting note and it's so much fun for people to read and people to experience. Because what we want to try and do is encourage our own members to try and think about what that flavour means to them in terms of what's happening in their memory about it because it's just so much more fun. I believe the most legendary SMWS tasting note involved a wetsuit. A wetsuit? Well, there have been uh, tasting notes involving condoms. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a flavoured condom, whiskey flavoured condom was one. Uh, the wetsuit one, what are you thinking about? That? I, if I remember it was a James Bond reference to Ursula Andress in a wetsuit. I think this was a Charlie McLean one from years ago. All oh, right, okay, 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 yeah. But, well, that's right. Some of these tasting notes will grab headlines, you know. The members will laugh and have some fun at them. They'll know that they'll, they'll definitely want to taste it. Uh, because of the attraction of the headline. So, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it's great fun. Charlie is one of the chairmen, as you've just mentioned, and a few other uh, chairmen who are very colourful with their words as well. What's the most unusual experience you've had on the road working for the society? Uh, most unusual experience? A few years ago, I was asked, I got a phone call from Edinburgh saying, can you do this tasting in London on the 2nd of May? I said, no, I'm going home to see my mother. She said, okay. A couple of weeks later, someone else phoned me from Edinburgh. I said, can you do this tasting in London? On the 2nd of May, I said, no, I'm going home to see my mother. I've already told someone that. What is this tasting anyway? She said, oh, it's the G20 Summit in London. I said, okay, my mother can wait. <laughs> and I did the tasting for the G20 Summit in London. We also did the tasting for Scotland House during the period of the London Olympics. So I was there almost every day, meeting people from around the world, doing tastings, and that was really, really great fun. And in more recent years, last four or five years, travelling around the world and just seeing how passionate people are about Scotch whisky and how much they know about this little country of ours. It's quite incredible. And how much many of them want to visit it. I thought you would... Uh say the incident in Victoria in January of 2018 during the Whiskey Festival with the uh, problems that the uh, society had with the, the British Columbia regulators and you guys had to go underground. I mentioned that earlier in the tasting, that was amazing. I was at uh, the Calgary Whiskey Festival with Kelly on the Thursday and leaving the festival and going back to the hotel, we were flying to uh, Victoria the following day, Kelly was on the phone to someone and I could see there was a problem and she and I said what is the problem she said oh I'll tell you tomorrow if it looks as if we might not have any whiskey so when we got there that's what in actual fact had happened we felt like we were back in some prohibition era it was quite amazing but because of Kerry and uh, Rob's ingenuity we managed to get a few tastings together in places we, where they weren't supposed to be and the whole thing I think was a, a success in the end what we were all very happy for was the fantastic support we got right across the industry from people like yourself and others who echoed our thoughts. This was just ridiculous in a modern day Canada. And uh, it still goes on. Fett's Whiskey Kitchen still don't have their whiskey back. We actually did a tasting in Fett's, but with 
proprietary branded whiskey and we're very thankful to those distilleries and uh, we were, uh, and we're hoping to do it again something. Do you think that'll ever get resolved? I'm hearing uh, around the, the place today that there's some positive noises. I think that uh, some people are very unhopeful of anything positive happening. Some people have a kind of a glass half full approach. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, you people in Canada will know a lot better than I how that thing is likely to to evolve. Where do you see the uh, society in a few more years as the 40th anniversary approaches? I think uh, what, is, what has been really happening in the last few years is the membership is growing and it's growing internationally. The international membership is now a very significant feature of our membership around the world. Uh, some countries where the, the site was very small are now growing dramatically, like uh, France and Germany, Denmark. Uh, Denmark's always been very strong ever since it opened in 2012. But in the, in the China, Japan and other Asian countries, it really is developing. So I think we'll see more of a global membership as the years go on. I also think there'll be more uh, distilleries for members to enjoy. There'll be more bottlings from distilleries I haven't seen for a while. We'll continue to innovate in accordance with what members seem to want from us, whether that be other spirits or finished whiskies or whatever. But it'll always be single cat. And we've even, we've even done, of course, recently, the blending malts, Exotic Cargo and Pea Ferry, which have gone down so well. We would never have dreamed of doing that 15 years ago. Uh, but now that we, we've done it, people are looking forward to the next ones. So that will be another angle, I think, another st string to our bow. Thanks to John McShane for spending some time with us on Whiskey Cast in Depth. By the way, there is still nothing yet to update on the status of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society case in British Columbia. As we heard back in January during our coverage from the Victoria Whiskey Festival, Fett's Whiskey Kitchen owners Eric and Allura Fergie have a hearing in May with provincial regulators. They've been accused of violating BC regulations by sourcing their whiskies through the SMWS partner retailer in Vancouver instead of the province's liquor distribution monopoly. Changes to that rule are part of a report submitted last year to BC Attorney General David Eby. Some of the recommendations have already been implemented We've been told by sources close to the B.C. government that more changes could be announced soon, perhaps even in time to resolve the case against FETS before it goes to a hearing. We'll keep you posted. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the new House Lannister Lagavulin 9-year-old. It's part of the Game of Thrones single malt scotch whiskey collection from Diageo and HBO. You'll find it at a whiskey shop near you. Check out the rest of the Lagavulin single malts at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I've had the chance to taste some great whiskeys this week. Let's start off with the relatively new Glenmorangie 19-year-old that's exclusively available in the travel retail market. It's matured in ex-bourbon barrels, and it's bottled at 43% ABV. The nose is floral and sweet, with touches of honey, butterscotch, and a hint of dried fruits. The taste has a citrusy tartness with touches of pineapple, grapefruit, and orange peel, balanced by hints of honey and butterscotch underneath. The finish, long, fruity, and tart. I'm scoring the Glenmorangie 19-year-old a 93. I mentioned the Glenfiddich Bourbon Barrel Reserve during the news. It's a 14-year-old single malt that's bottled at 43% ABV. The nose has a nice honey sweetness along with muted spices, vanilla, and just a hint of oak. The taste is peppery with allspice and a hint of cinnamon, along with dark chocolate, honey, and a touch of vanilla. The finish becomes long and creamy as the spices fade with honey, vanilla, and a touch of dark chocolate. I'm scoring the Glenfiddich Bourbon Barrel Reserve a 92. 
I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute. But first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. The Bernheim name has a unique place in Kentucky whiskey's history, and we're proud to make our whiskeys at the Bernheim Distillery in Louisville. Our Bernheim original wheat whiskey was the first new style of American whiskey introduced after the end of Prohibition, with a smooth, mellow taste that's unique, just like its name. Find out more at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Anak recently came out with the second release of its 35-year-old single malt from the Nakdu Distillery. It's bottled at 41% ABV. The nose has notes of honey, vanilla, caramel candies, and just a hint of oak. The taste is thick, oily, and chewy with a good citrusy tartness, white pepper, honey, and vanilla. The finish is long, tart, and luscious. It's an excellent whiskey. And I'm scoring the Anak 35-year-old second release a 94. Finally, I had the chance to try one of the rare independent bottlings from Japan's Aigashima Distillery the other night. This one was an Oloroso sherry cask bottling from Black Adder, bottled at 61.5% ABV. The nose has notes of figs and toffee, along with dates, raisins, plums, and just a hint of dark chocolate. The taste has all of that and more. It's spicy with clove and black pepper notes that complement the fruits nicely with a thick, chewy mouthfeel. And the finish is long and spicy with dried fruits, toffee, and raisins. By the way, this one was distilled in June of 2014 and bottled in November of 2017. Not quite three and a half years old. I'm scoring the Black Adder Aigashima Oloroso Sherry Cask a 93. And who says young whiskeys can't be good? The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,500 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Your voice is presented by Lot 40. More comments on our interview with Kat Augustin two weeks ago about the way that some guys treat women in the world of whiskey. At CNick63 tweeted this. Mark, I finished listening to episode 758. I agree with you 200%. If the whiskey is great, the person, in all caps, who distilled it is to be congratulated, period. If some want to be biased, fine. That leaves more for the rest of us. And the other day, someone asked this question on Quora.com. Is Pappy Van Winkle the best whiskey? Okay, let's take a deep breath now. My immediate answer was no. After all, there is no such thing as the best whiskey, only the one you like the most, and that's going to be different for each one of us. Yes, many of the Pappy expressions are good, but the best whiskey? Not by a long shot. If you scroll down through my tasting notes on the WhiskeyCast website, the default is by overall score, and you'll have to scroll for a while before you find any of the pappies. That doesn't make them bad, it just means I didn't like them as much. And judging from the reaction, I'm not the only one who feels that way. Here's a tweet from at Whiskey Files. Recently paid $60 for a pour of Pappy 20 to see if it was as good as I remembered. Wish I had that back to buy a bottle of 1920 instead. Jill Day at JAD627 tweeted this. 
Find one prior to 2010 when they were closer to 140 proof. 2006 release is a game changer and a must try. Thanks for the suggestion, Jill. And from Tom Moore at Timor 71, excellent reply. What one loves, another hates. Thanks for having my back, gang. And if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers from around the world, you can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast, or you can just email me. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other stuff that all make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Peter Hosek sent this email the other day from Vienna, Austria. Recently, I have heard the term STR cask from more angles, especially from starting distilleries. Can you possibly shed some light on the term and how it influences maturation? Glad to, Peter. STR was a term coined by the late Dr. Jim Swan. It's a process that he developed for the startup distilleries that he worked with to improve the quality of their wine casks. STR stands for shaved, toasted, and recharred. And I had a chance to see it done firsthand at Taiwan's King Car Distillery back in the summer of 2017 when master blender Ian Chang took us through the cooperage that they built at the distillery just to make STR casks. They start by shaving the inside of each cask with a plane to remove the outer layer of wood. The reason why we do this uh, shaving is because we, we want to remove these uh, organic acids. Because uh, apparently after our analysis by doing GCMS uh, with different depths into the wood from inside to outside, we have noticed that uh, for these organic acids, they only penetrate into a certain depth. So if we can shave, the, uh, shave those parts off, we remove the unwanted acids, but we retain all these fruity characters from the previous uh, wine you know, uh, maturation. So now what we have here is uh, fruity without the acids, whereas this is uh, unshaven. It has the acids and also the, uh, the fruity characters. And then this one will be ready for uh, the second stage of toasting. And toasting is really important for uh, flavor creation because by doing a um, toasting purpose uh, process, we can break down some of the lignin structures and then they will form these uh, nice uh, vanilla and also whiskey lactone and so on. And they will combine with the uh, wine fruitiness to, uh, to form new layers of uh, complex aromas in a whiskey. And uh, also, one, one thing that is very noticeable is that uh, once it is toasted, you can smell that very nice sweet corn and also peach character, which is uh, very desirable, desirable for, for consumers to have that very nice uh, fruity and also uh, you know, something that for you to nose and then you want to drink. And also very important to control the temperature and also the time of toasting. Because uh, if we don't have high enough temperature, you cannot break down the, uh, the wood structure to form all these extra layers of aromas. And if it's too high, you destroy these flavors. Therefore, we need to control the uh, temperature to a very certain degree and also toast it for a certain period of time. You cannot do it, you cannot overdo it, and you cannot underdo it either because uh, it is all very important, the two combine, and then we can create all these extra flavors. And then finally, uh, it will be charred. In this case, charring the outside layer locks those flavors created by toasting into the wood while making it a little easier for the new make spirit to soak in. It's not used for anything other than red wine casks, and the exact process varies slightly from distillery to distillery, depending on the character of that distillery's spirit. 
In addition to Cavalan, you'll find STR casks in use at many other distilleries that worked with Jim Swan, including the Cotswolds Distillery in England, Lindoris Abbey Distillery in Scotland, and Victoria Caledonian Distillery here in Canada. Peter, I hope this answers your question, and thanks for sending it in. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. Support for our coverage of the Wonderful World of Whiskey show comes from the NAV Center here in Cornwall, Ontario. Special thanks to Ian Bentley and the entire staff of the NAV Center for their hospitality this weekend. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can find links for our WhiskeyCast HD videos and the WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast, along with the latest whiskey news, events, photos, tasting notes, and a whole lot more, including our complete archive of past episodes all the way back to 2005. We'd love to hear from you. You can get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast, or just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you most of the time from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. But this time around, I'm at the NAV Center for the Wonderful World of Whiskey show in Cornwall, Ontario. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.